you may know the Sackler name as the one recently pried off some major institutions around the world, including the Louvre, NYU, and Tufts right here in Boston. It belongs to the multi-billionaire family that owns Purdue Pharma, who've made their money marketing the powerful and highly addictive painkiller Oxycontin, which has helped fuel an opioid crisis that's killed roughly 500,000 people in the U.S. since 1999. And as my next guest has written, quote, prior to the introduction of OxyContin, America did not have an opioid crisis. After the introduction of OxyContin, it did. Lawsuits abound, including from Massachusetts Attorney General Maura Healy, who is now trying to prevent the family from using bankruptcy to protect their personal fortune and the privacy of their drug peddling strategies. A new book exposes all the details. It's called Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty. Author Patrick Radden Keefe joins me now. Patrick, congratulations and welcome. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Can we start at the end? I am prone to hyperbole, I admit it, but I don't think I am here. I finish re reading your book, and here's the conclusion I reach. It's a story of an American crime family that recklessly, and that may be kind, recklessly is responsible for thousands, if not 10, 000, tens of thousands of deaths, then loots their company and tries to sack their money away, billions away, in such a fashion that neither victims nor the governments can ever get access to it. Is that unfair in any regard? That seems about right. I mean, this is one of the really strange things about the end game of this story. OxyContin was released in 1996 by Purdue Pharma, this company that's wholly owned by the Sackler family. The drug has generated some $35 billion since then. And you've actually had two federal guilty pleas by this company, two criminal charges, once in 2007 and then again in 2020. And in the interim, what happened was that the Sackler family, who owned the company and were really calling the shots for a long time, were quietly pulling money out of the company, $500 million here, $400 million there. We know that they took at least $10 billion out of the company. And then they kicked it into bankruptcy. So that's where we find ourselves today. But let's be clear, those criminal investigations and convictions, one, were not of the Sacklers. They were of lower level people. And at least the earlier one, I don't know about the more recent one, has had absolutely no deterrent effect on their behavior, correct? That's right. So in 2007, there were three executives who, who uh, faced misdemeanor charges. Um, which they pled guilty to. They didn't spend a day in prison. And at the time, it was a $600 million fine for the company. Uh, but the company was making billions of dollars a year selling OxyContin at that point. Some people worried, this is just a speeding ticket. You're not going to change their behavior. Fast forward to 2020, turns out that was right because they plead guilty to a whole raft of new federal criminal charges. This time, you didn't even get misdemeanor charges against any executives. It's this crazy thing where the company pled guilty to, to criminal charges, but no individual executives were named. So I, I say in the book, it's almost like it was a driverless car, mm. like the corporation is acting autonomously. You know, I, I learned a little bit of science from you, too, not one of my strong suits. It's the cotton in OxyContin that was the game changer. Could you briefly explain what, what that means? Yeah, the real innovation uh, that Purdue Pharma had was this content system, which is basically the seal around a pill. Content's short for continuous. And what that means is that the active ingredient, there was an earlier drug actually, which is a morphine drug, a morphine pill, and then OxyContin, where the active ingredient is oxycodone, this powerful uh, opioid painkiller. It slowly and continuously enters your bloodstream over the course of, of hours. So you have this kind of time release mechanism. And that was what was really innovative about OxyContin. And even though oxycodone was more, OxyContin was more powerful than morphine, not only did the Sacklers have this innovation of marketing directly to the prescribers, the doctors, they chose never to tell the doctors that they were wrong, that in fact uh, OxyContin was more powerful and thus more dangerous than morphine, correct? That's right. So you have this amazing moment with OxyContin where they had had this earlier drug, a morphine drug, that was very successful with the cancer pain market. And the company basically decided, we've got this new drug, OxyContin, but we don't want to niche that for people with cancer. There's only so many people who have cancer. What if we pitched this not just for severe pain, but actually for moderate pain? So it's not some nuclear solution that you graduate to when other remedies have failed. It's the first course of treatment for anyone in, who's in pain, even moderate pain. They had a tag line that they used at the time, uh, the kind of marketing phrase, which was that OxyContin was the one to start with and the one to stay with. 
You know, and also throughout this whole thing, the brilliance, uh, I think, even though I guess it's pretty simple, is it is fine to affix our names to institutions that people love, from museums, we know it in this city, to museums, to academic institutions, but let's keep our name out of that Purdue, it's not called Sackler Pharma, it's Purdue Pharma, but that was a conscious way to proceed with their business, no? That's exactly right. I mean, I, I grew up in in Boston, uh, so I, you know the Sackler Museum at Harvard uh, was familiar to me. I I had seen the name, and I, I live in New York now. The name is plastered all over big institutions here, like the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Part of what I was trying to do in the in the book was actually not just tell the OxyContin story, but go back and look at multiple generations of this family. And what's oh. fascinating is. Dating back to the early days, I mean, they, they made their first big fortune marketing Valium in the 1960s. And dating back to the 1950s, 1960s, there was this tendency in this family to want to do philanthropic giving, where you see your name on universities and art museums, but to always obscure the source of the family wealth. So when I first started reporting on the Sacklers in 2017 for The New Yorker, I went to the website of Purdue Pharma, this company they own, and I searched and searched That's to crazy. see if I could find the Sackler name. And it was nowhere. So you have this bizarre thing where they have kind of a mania for putting it on buildings, but not on the family business. Well, uh, the local connection here is not just you. I didn't know you were from Boston. But in addition to your Boston roots, and we see the names, or at least have seen the names on some buildings, there's also an attorney general connection here. Maura Healy's been pretty aggressive in their pursuit. Here she is, let me get the date right, in 2018, talking about a lawsuit she filed against these folks. Not only do we name the company today, but we've also chosen to name executives and directors. Ours is the first lawsuit in the country to name those executives personally and to tell the story of how they contributed to this deadly crisis. We owe it to everyone in this room, to families across this state, to hold Purdue and its executives accountable for their role in creating this epidemic. But if they have their way in this bankruptcy proceeding, they will get out unscathed. They get out with their billions and their personal fortune after, as I said before, and as you report, they've looted the company from which they've made all their money. So it is in the hands, I guess, of both the attorneys general who are holding out, like Healy, and the bankruptcy judge, correct? That's right, and there's there's another factor in the mix, actually. So you What's end that? up in this great situation where the Sacklers have not declared bankruptcy themselves, but there's a bankruptcy judge who basically wants to seal them off, you know, to shield them from these lawsuits by states like Massachusetts. Congress has uh, has introduced there's a there's a bill in Congress called the Sackler Act, and if this were to pass between now and August, what it would do is say. A federal bankruptcy judge in New York does not get to tell the state of Massachusetts or the state of New York or any other state that they can't proceed with their lawsuits against the Sacklers. So if that were to pass, all bets are off, and you could actually see some real form of accountability. You know, beyond, uh, speaking of accountability, there are two kinds, well, there are many kinds. Obviously, there's financial accountability, which for the most part they've escaped, at least personally. There's also criminal liability, the orange jumpsuit notion. But the Sacklers, like so many corporate leaders who have uh, misdeeds, to be euphemistic, have apparently insulated themselves from the behavior of the company to the extent that criminal prosecution of the Sacklers themselves does not seem terribly likely. Does it or, or does it? I don't think it is. I mean, pe people have talked about it. I think those would be tough cases to bring. I, I, I think certainly if you read my book, if you look at the uh, at, at the legal complaint that, that Maura Healy prepared, um, there is ample evidence of criminal misconduct by this company at a time when the family is dominating the board of the company, calling the shots at the company, and reaping billions and billions of dollars from the company. So it may be that our system is rigged in favor of the billionaire class in such a way that they're shielded from real criminal liability for their for their own conduct. Uh, but I think to anybody with eyes in their head who's looking at this story seriously, if you want to know where the responsibility is, uh, it's with them. You know, you reported a great story, but you haven't written the end of the story. I'm hoping you'll sort of in Nostradamus-like fashion write it right here. What is the end of the story? Do they get away with this? I mean, you say criminal prosecution is unlikely. Are they able to escape with billions of dollars in personal wealth and all their art collections and just have the company that they looted go down the drain? That's what they're proposing. I mean, they've, they've proposed that they would pay a little over $4 billion in order to um, 
helped remediate the opioid crisis, that they would admit no wrongdoing mm -hmm. and that they would be shielded from any future lawsuits and walk away with their billions. I do think it remains to be seen whether or not that actually plays out. People like Maura Healy will be instrumental in, in figuring that out uh, in the coming months and these other states' attorney generals. The, there's one thing I would say, though, which is that there's another kind of accountability, which is reputational accountability. Yeah. And in part, this is a story about a family that managed through a kind of con to write the family out of the history of the family business. And I think those days are over. I think people know what the Sackler name means uh, in a fuller sense today and uh, the, the real legacy that they will leave behind. Let's hope it doesn't end with reputation. Your book is both enraging and brilliant. Patrick, thanks so much for your time. Oh, thank you for having me. The book again is Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty.